Cairo 7 Eyewitness News at 6.30 begins right now. We are following the latest details on breaking news in Snohomish County after a deadly police shooting. Good evening, I'm Christy Lee. I'm Steve Rabel. Police say the victim robbed a nearby bank and then took off. Our North Sound Bureau Chief Ana Velasquez is live outside the fast food restaurant where the shooting took place. Ana? We'll take a look at this scene behind me. It's just completely taped off. There's a McDonald's, and there you see detectives with Snohomish County Sheriff's Office and Everett. They are comparing notes, trying to figure out exactly what happened. One question they need to answer is whether or not the suspect was armed. The suspect's body is covered with a sheet as police investigate what happened. They say it started around 4.12 this afternoon when the suspect walked into the Washington Mutual Bank a few miles away inside of Fred Meyer. They say the suspect went up to the teller and demanded money, and he fled. A few minutes later, deputies found him here in the parking lot of the McDonald's. They say there was a confrontation and shots were fired, and the suspect was dead at the scene. Eyewitnesses describe what happened. And then we heard something like, and then the guy was right there, and the guy turned around, and then they yelled at him, and then we heard a shot, and I was like, man. And we saw a cop, the first cop car, and then we saw the guy bleeding, and the cop had like an AR-15, and they were trying to resuscitate. Now, as you can see around me, this is a very, very busy parking lot, very busy shopping plaza. There's an Albertsons here, including the fast food, and there's a lot of eyewitnesses that detectives will be questioning, as well as trying to figure out what exactly what happened. But because it is an officer-involved shooting involving this Nahomish County Sheriff's Office, they tell me that Everett Police will be the lead investigating agency here. For now, reporting live, I'm North Sound Bureau Chief Ana Velasquez, Carol 7 Eyewitness News. Tonight, geologists are trying to figure out what's triggering hundreds of earthquakes under Mount St. Helens. We send South Sound Bureau Chief Richard Thompson to the volcano to see if it's a re reawakening. Well, tonight, officials here don't believe that these earthquakes are a safety concern, but at the moment, they only have a theory as to what's causing them. There's one quake, two quakes, three quakes, uh, that occurred in a minute time frame. Visitors to Mount St. Helens today are amazed to see that the seismograph has recorded more than seven to 800 small earthquakes under the volcano in the past 24 hours. Pretty amazing. Scary, first of all. And some people from Austria were ready to catch the next plane home when they heard the news. Is this real? Yeah. Oh, I go home. <laughs> but geologists and rangers quickly point out these quakes are all shallow, occurring less than a half mile deep. That, they say, is not what we'd likely see if the mountain were coming back to life. And deeper quakes would indicate that possibly magma might be rising, but we're not recording deep quakes. These are all very shallow quakes. Just to be sure, scientists will be doing some additional investigation at the mountain. A lot of the geologists feel that this is uh, possibly due to groundwater underneath Mount St. Helens. For now, there are no restrictions on hiking or climbing at Mount St. Helens. And although visitors are surprised to hear about so many earthquakes, they don't seem to be too terribly worried. Nature does what it wants to do, and we can't do anything about it, that's for sure. Tonight, we're told the last swarm of these small earthquakes occurred here in 2001. They usually last a day or two, but can go on for as much as a week. Reporting at Mount St. Helens, I'm South Sound Bureau Chief Richard Thompson, Cairo 7 Eyewitness News. 24 years after the eruption of Mount St. Helens, the scars of that event are still visible in the Toodle River Valley. Tourists still come to see the A-frame house that was buried in 200 tons of mud and a warehouser truck that was crushed by, or by a huge stump. Clara Otenson Wilkins watched the mountain blow from her kitchen window near Castle Rock. Yes, uh, what fascinated me was uh, the lightning strikes that were coming down on each side of the big plume. That plume uh, of ash pushed ash 80,000 feet into the air. The blast flattened everything within 15 miles of the volcano. 200 homes were destroyed, 57 lives lost. You can see the amazing wave of earthquakes showing up on area seismographs. Plus, get a lot more information on Mount St. Helens anytime on our website. Just go to CairoTV.com. A construction worker is dead and his co-worker is in jail tonight after an argument erupted in violence. The 45-year-old suspect, whose name has not yet been released, could be charged with manslaughter. He and the other worker began arguing at their work site in Kedmore yesterday afternoon. The dispute continued at a nearby fast food restaurant where the suspect's family says he tried to avoid a physical confrontation. We're a very tight-knit family and we're devastated for the man's family. 
this is not, you know, this is not what our family's about. But a fist fight broke out and 43-year-old Michael Bender died later at the hospital. The suspect is being held on half a million dollars bond. Turns out that a man who is missing after his empty fishing boat was found is a registered sex offender. The boat was found empty in Capitol Lake in Olympia a week ago. Now we learn the missing man is 43-year-old Len L. Peterson, a registered sex offender from Tumwater. He was also recently charged with theft in Cowlitz County. More trouble for an adventure race running through western Washington, this time in Snohomish County. Rescuers were called out overnight to help a team of racers reportedly lost near Helena Peak, that's near Granite Falls. On Tuesday, one of the racers was hit by a falling rock and killed in Skagit County at Illibot Peak. The Primal Quest race resumed yesterday after a day's break following that deadly accident. Forty-nine four-member teams are hiking, biking, and kayaking in a race through the San Juan Islands and North Cascades. It's supposed to end tonight. Improved weather today for those searching the Alaskan wilderness for two local men. Jim and Joe Murphy are twin brothers from Squim and Bremerton. They were on a float plane that disappeared near Sitka, Alaska on Monday. Poor weather hampered the search effort until today, but searchers are not discouraged. It's a very, very intense a uh, dedicated group of people, and they're uh, they're not showing any signs of letting up, you know, letting up the search. We just want people to know down in your area that uh, the best of the best are working on it. Search helicopters will work through the night using infrared technology and night vision goggles to spot the missing men. But searchers say the weather is expected to grow worse this weekend. It's only a matter of time until we know for sure if Snohomish County will be the next site for NASCAR's newest racetrack. County Executive Aaron Reardon says that he should know for sure by Monday if the racetrack will become a reality. Folks there are already bracing for what might happen, and the possibilities are drawing mixed reviews. I think that it would be good for the area with the income of the tax base. It would be more like jobs for a lot of people, but the thing that I would not really like would be the traffic. A group called Snohomish County Citizens Against a Racetrack has collected about 2,500 signatures, and organizers say they haven't given up their fight against the NASCAR racetrack. It's a bitter family feud over the estate of legendary musician Jimi Hendrix. The details ahead on Eyewitness News at 6.30. Plus, it's on the move again. The Colocala heads towards its new home. And one western governor okays driving solo in the carpool lanes, but there is a hitch. I'm Andy Wapla in the Pinpoint Severe Weather Center. A little fall and a little summer, too, coming in our way this weekend. The latest all ahead in the Pinpoint 5-day forecast coming up on Cairo 7 Eyewitness News. A decision tonight in the lawsuit over a local rock star's legacy. Guitarist and singer Jimi Hendrix left no will when he died in 1970. His estate went to his father, Al. After Al died a couple of years ago, Jimmy's brother sued, claiming Al's adopted daughter, Janie, had cut him out. Today, the court ruled against Leon Hendricks, but Jimmy's brother says he's hopeful the judge will give him some consideration when it meets again over details in a couple of weeks. Justice, we reveal. It's, it's all good. Your hopes for the rest of the case? Yes, we have your hopes. I think they're going to, I think the judge is kind of making a way for him to make a good judgment on the 15th. The court's decision means that Janie Hendrix gets to keep control over the multi-million dollar Hendrix legacy. She says she is gratified by the ruling decision, but the saddened by the lawsuit itself. A key figure in one of the state's largest ever fraud cases just pleaded guilty today to a series of charges stemming from the Zenetics fiasco. Donovan Claff, uh, Claflin, seen here in court sketches, was scolded by the judge during today's sentencing for spending investors' money on, quote, obscene excesses. Several years ago, an auction was held to try and recoup some of the $91 million lost by the Bainbridge Island Health Maintenance Company. Claflin will spend more than three years in prison. He's now one of a dozen from the company to be convicted of securities and stock fraud. New tonight at 6.30, a teenager spends the night in jail after a prank with a fake gun. Authorities in Skagit County say the teen pointed a replica of James Bond's gun at a school bus driver who was taking a swim team to a meet. Police arrested the 19-year-old on investigation of first-degree assault. The driver said she feared for her safety and the safety of the 20 people on the bus as they drove along Highway 20 near LaConnor. Tacoma's school superintendent is trying to snuff out the uproar over changes in recess there. He says recess is not being banned. But Tacoma schools want to let teachers take a break when it makes sense, not on a precise schedule that might interrupt the middle of a lesson. 
We get the very newest on Andy's Pinpoint Weather Forecast straight ahead. It was a trip to Seattle that changed their lives. Ahead on Eyewitness News, a little boy saves the life of his dying mother. In less than 24 hours, the ferry Kalakala is expected to be at its new home, Tacoma. Cairo 7 Eyewitness News reporter Kevin McCarty tells us why some in that city are already unhappy the troubled boat is headed for town. The ferry Kalakala will soon be headed for the port of Tacoma, but it's shrouded in mystery. The owners are saying very little about where the old ferry boat is going to be tying up. Somewhere along the High Lewis Waterway in Tacoma waits a new home for the historic ferry Kalakala. Hopefully it's not an eyesore for whoever gets it. The Kalakala left Seattle last March, bound for Nia Bay and eventually its permanent home in Port Angeles. At that time, owner Steve Rodriguez was being forced off Lake Union and out of the city. The Kalakala needs to have a sense of community. Seattle doesn't have it right now. But the stay in Nia Bay was short and contentious. The Macaw Tribe, owners of the marina, say the old ferry did thousands of dollars in damage to their dock and created a public nuisance. They wanted it out of town. So once again, the rusting hulk will be towed to yet another home. But before it even arrives here in Tacoma, the mayor says he doesn't want the Kalakala in his town. The two largest marinas on the High Lewis Waterway say they don't have room for the ferry. One local man has some simple advice for owners to avoid getting evicted again. Start putting money into it real quick so it doesn't be a burden for anyone, you know, and it isn't an eyesore. All we're being told at this point is that the owner, Steve Rodriguez, will hold a news conference here in Tacoma when the ferry boat pulls into town. That's expected sometime tomorrow evening. In Tacoma, Kevin McCarty, Cairo 7 Eyewitness News. Traffic is back to normal tonight on I-5 at the Ship Canal Bridge after a huge mess blocked two northbound lanes this morning. A truck carrying a mix of mud and asphalt chunks accidentally dumped part of its load just after 10 this morning, covering one lane and partly blocking another. Traffic was backed up for hours while DOT crews cleaned up the mess with shovels and sweeper trucks. A new study could reignite the spotted owl debate, which has raged in northwest forests for years. Researchers found the owl population is still declining. The threat now, though, isn't as much from loss of habitat through logging, but from wildfires and from the barred owl, which is taking over its cousin's territory. The findings could deal a huge blow to the timber companies that have been lobbying to loosen logging restrictions in federal forests where the spotted owl lives. Big changes are coming to California roadways. Soon you'll see solo drivers in the carpool lane, but there is a catch. Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger just signed a law allowing solo drivers in hybrid cars to use the HOV lanes any time of day. Officials hope this will encourage car companies to manufacture more gas-saving vehicles. A South Carolina mother is home tonight after a trip to Seattle where her son saved her life. Chris Bridges was diagnosed with leukemia last December. She entered the University of Washington Medical Center last summer after finding a bone marrow match, her seven-year-old son, Mason. It was about a half a percent um, chance for a child to match a parent. I was happy to know that I got to do something really important. Doctors say because of the successful bone marrow transplant, Chris could make a full recovery. The Bridges family, three boys and a girl, along with their parents, left Seattle today on a donated chartered plane back to their home in South Carolina. What a fantastic finish to a very gray day. And our weekend will go the same way. Slow to start, but very nice to finish. Downtown Seattle right now, beautiful sunset. We talk about one volcano here tonight. There's another one, not quite so active. Mount Rainier in the distance, picking up some of that sunset. Sunset only about 15 minutes away. But this morning, we couldn't see a thing through that pinpoint city cam or any of our other cameras either with the heavy fog. We'll see some more of that fog tomorrow morning. Maybe not quite as heavy, but it is coming back. 56 right now at our pinpoint neighborhood station in Port Townsend. We 65 today at SeaTac, and over the weekend, we're going to go past that to around 70 in many places. 50s though now, and our temperature's heading down with our sunset just after 7. 57 degrees right now for Everett, 59 in downtown Seattle. Auburn at 62, it was 68 about an hour and a half ago, so that temperature falling quickly. 61 in Issaquah, and into the upper 60s for Wenatchee, 68 there. That was in the upper 70s a while ago, too, so down those temperatures go tonight, but up they go over the weekend. Pinpoint forecast for the evening, very nice. Our sunset, though, pretty soon. 
afternoon, minutes away. Fair skies, though, sunset or not. Temperatures, though, falling into the mid to upper 50s the next couple hours. If you're out on this Friday night, probably pretty mild as you head out for your evening. Kind of cool, though, later here tonight and certainly chilly overnight. We'll see more fog by tomorrow morning and even late this evening. Temperatures in the 40s and 50s tonight with more spots toward the 40s than into the 50s. The fog is not likely to be quite as heavy as the last couple mornings, but it will be there. Pinpoint satellite picture shows just a few clouds around the area. As we come out a bit, not much to be seen. Just a few high, thin clouds left around the area now, and that's it. So nice to have a clear weekend. Our last couple weekends of summer, not so great. Our first weekend of fall is nice, but it starts cool. 44 at Olympia, 51 in Seattle for the morning. By the afternoon, though, that 44 at Olympia becomes a 72. And 70 at SeaTac, that'd be the first time in two weeks we would have gotten to 70. Morning fog then, an afternoon sun, a beautiful weekend. And we'll do this a couple more times after that. North end of the Sound, 67 in Bellingham and Whidbey Island as well. 71 for the Linwood area. Temperatures mainly then in the upper 60s for the north end, but a couple of 70s here and there, especially the further away from the Sound you get. The Sound is cool. There'll be more fog around Whidbey Island, you get away from that, likely to be closer to 70. Same sort of story along the coast, mid to upper 60s right by the ocean beaches with a bit more fog, a bit less fog and a bit warmer around Chehalis. 73 there, pretty nice for the first weekend of autumn. Better than a lot of the last weekends of summer we had, in fact. We stay on the nice side of our weather pattern, too, for the next few days. 10.5 day forecast is morning clouds and afternoon sun, and not just tomorrow, but throughout the weekend. A little cloudier on Sunday, but I don't want to over, uh, overdo that idea too much. Still plenty of sunshine on Sunday in upper 60s. Then a couple days into the 70s, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We went weeks without a 70. Now here comes a bunch. CowardTV.com is the place to go anytime as we head into the weekend. Payback time for a very soggy mm. September. This is a nice way to finish the month. Well, enjoy it. Thanks, Andy. Coming up, we'll see how each row and the Mariners are doing down in Texas tonight. Also, the last time the Huskies went to Notre Dame, it wasn't pretty. Greg England has a preview of tomorrow's game when we come back. On the season premiere of only Cairo 7 Eyewitness News brings you 11 minutes of uninterrupted news and weather in the first 11 minutes. Watch 11 at 11 tonight on Cairo 7 Eyewitness News. When the Huskies face Notre Dame tomorrow, they'll be trying to beat the Fighting Irish for the first time ever. The Irish, a perfect 4-0 against the UW. Two schools last met back in 1996 when Lou Holtz was a Notre Dame head coach. Irish pounded the Dogs 54-20. The Dogs are on the road again this year. And they need to beat the Irish to avoid an 0-3 start. That ain't easy, but what else? You got to do it. I mean, you're going to go party, so what are you going to do? Stay at home? I'm going to go back to Notre Dame and play a great team and um, get ready for my first win. Meanwhile, the Cougars will play at Arizona tomorrow. And Josh Swagger is scheduled to get the start at quarterback. Bill Doba says Josh had a good week of practice and he expects a tough test from the Wildcats. Well, I think there's it's kind of like uh, Idaho in a way. There's a new coaching staff. They're very enthusiastic. They're young. Uh, they're jumping up and down on the sideline, and, and, you know, they've been competitive or won all their games, and defensively, I think they're playing extremely well. At Quest Field today, the Western Washington Vikings got in one last practice before the battle in Seattle. Tomorrow night, the Vikings will play Central Washington in town here for the second straight year. It's the biggest rivalry for these two schools, and they get to play it on the biggest stage. Uh, this is huge. I mean, it, uh, uh, this is a heart of our recruiting area. I think it's a heart of Central's recruiting area. So, uh, you know, right up and down the I-5 corridor, we've got a lot of players with, uh, you know, their, their roots are right here. So Whenever the, these two teams line up, they bring out the best in each other, and it's, uh, it's a good rivalry, and it's hard fought, and it's going to be a hard fought physical football game. To baseball, the Mariners' road trip moves on to Arlington, where the Rangers have been on a roll. Texas now only two games behind the A's in the AL West, but each row is even hotter than the Rangers. Tonight in the third, each row, legging out another infield single. Look at him run. So far, he's one for three tonight. That's 248 hits on the season. He needs 10 more to break the record for the most hits in one season right now. Rangers leading 6-5 in the fifth inning. So still plenty of time. I don't know, maybe four or five hits for each row. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Tonight. Are there any predictions as to what city he'll be in when he hits that? You know, record? I think uh, I think he's going to do it midweek, so I think it could be uh, Oakland next. Oh. I think he'll do it before they come back here to Seattle. All right. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you again at 11 o'clock. Cairo 7 Pinpoint Weather can be heard on AM 880 KIXI with Jim and Jim in the morning and great songs, great memories all day long. 
Cairo 7 Eyewitness News, winner of the Emmy for Best Daily Newscast, and recipient of the 2003 National Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence. I'm Patty.